liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Okay, approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion? Make a motion. We approve the agenda as submitted. Second. Got a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Approval of the minutes for September 6, 2023. Everybody had a chance to review those. Make a motion to approve minutes for closed session September the 6th. Second. All those in favor? Approval of the minutes for September 6, 2023. Open session. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Initiation of the project was actually a feasibility study commissioned by Queen Anne's County Public Schools back in 2020. And that feasibility study was evaluating both comprehensive renovation of the existing building and construction of a new building uh, on an alternate site. So this is the building that we're currently sitting in. I think it's a building that we're all pretty familiar with. It's had a rich and storied history. Uh, starting with its construction in 1901 as Centerville High School. That's the image in the, in the lower left. Um, there were various additions over the years, most notably in the 1950s. The building continued to serve as the high school until Queen Anne's County Public High School was built in 1966. Um, it then served as the middle school from 67 up until the time um, when it was taken over for its current use, which is as the central office uh, for Queen Anne's County Public Schools, and that was just before 1980. So, um, again, it's a building that is 120 years old plus. Uh, Two-thirds of its life has roughly been as an educational facility. The last third has been um, as an office building, as a, as a central office. So the feasibility study in 2020, again, the charge was to evaluate both renovation of the building for continued use as a central office, as well as evaluating uh, a specific site, which was the Vincent Street site, which is uh, located across the street from the high school. It's a parcel owned by the county and made available for, for Board of Ed use for this purpose, um, should they wish. The uh, both scenarios uh, were evaluated with multiple concepts. So multiple concepts of renovation inside the existing building, multiple concepts of a new building on, um, on the proposed alternate site. And the, um, the sort of thrust of that evaluation was done along um, an evaluation of, of the program. So that was, this is a spreadsheet, there's a lot of numbers on the spreadsheet, but to orient you, the two left columns um, are program numbers for the existing building that we're in. The green um, columns in the center are potential renovation options of this building. The columns in orange were a number of different scenarios that were, ex um, explored on the alternate site. The program data um, was obtained by meeting and soliciting from departments their current and future needs, um, as well as um, evaluating the existing space usage within, within the building. So I, I wanna focus in on one row in this table, which is the building multiplier row. So it's about halfway down the page there. And I want to focus on three scenarios, one for the existing building, one for the potential renovated building, 
one for a potential new building and how those affect that building multiplier column. And we'll try to do that graphically over the next several slides here. So this is, um, this is the first floor of the building that we're sitting in right now of the existing uh, Board of Ed building. And as we look at these plans and think about a building multiplier, first we need to know what, what is a building multiplier. So a building multiplier is obtained simply by taking the gross overall square footage of the building and dividing that by the net programmed space. Okay, so what's the net program space? The net program space is um, any space that's programmed for an intended use. So that's offices, conference rooms, um, specifically programmed storage rooms, things like that. When uh, a client puts together a building program and says, these are the spaces that I need in the building. What the net program space does not include is things like circulation, wall thicknesses, mechanical and electrical rooms, stairwells, um, restrooms, essentially all the elements that you need to knit all these programmatic pieces together um, and they make a building in their totality. So this, right, in this existing first floor plan, this blue that's shown shade, shaded is essentially the circulation space in the building. It looks like a lot of circulation space it is, the building was originally designed and constructed as a school building. So if we look over on the west wing here, you have a large corridor, in this case, uh, an eight foot wide corridor, flanked by fairly large rooms, which would be classroom size rooms, and that is the general disposition of the building. You have corridors that essentially range six, eight, 12 feet wide on the eastern wing. And that is not, that's not uncommon for an educational facility. That's what you need in an educational facility. There are code requirements. You have obviously tons of students moving through the building all at one time. Um, so, so these are requirements. This plan is interesting because if you look in the back of the building, uh, in one of the, the latest or the later additions to the building on the back side, there's an area there that was uh, retrofitted when this became an office building. If you look at the scale of those spaces, it gives you a really good sort of datum to measure the rest of the building against. So obviously the rooms are smaller, offices are smaller than classrooms, but What's really interesting is look at the corridors that run through that back area. That's a more traditional four or five foot wide office or business corridor as opposed to the corridors that you see running through the rest of the building. All right, so what, what does all that mean? The building multiplier, again, we take the overall gross square footage of the building, which in this case is about 47,000 square feet, and you divide that by the programmed space. The program space in the Board of Ed building here in 2020, when we surveyed the departments and did it, um, was just under 24,000 square feet. So you divide 47 by 23.5, you get a building multiplier of two. The building multiplier is a direct inverse of the building efficiency. So a building multiplier of two means that you have a 50% efficient building. That doesn't sound great, but it also makes sense because you're using larger spaces for smaller uses. You have circulation that's oversized, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so how can you make that better? So these are the renovation scenarios that are looked at. How can you make the building more efficient? When you look at renovating an existing building, you look at quantitative and qualitative measures, okay? So let's tackle the qualitative measures first. I think we would all agree there are plenty of qualitative measures that could and should be improved in this building, whether you're talking about um, envelope, right, with water tightness, or lack of water tightness, or energy efficiency of the envelope, um, whether you're talking about mechanical and plumbing systems that have a lot of age, that are old, or that just simply don't meet current expectations for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning in an office building type space, uh, or finishes, finishes that are older, that have reached the end of their useful life. All of these things can be addressed and can be successfully addressed. Um, it takes time and it takes money, right? 
but they can be addressed, absolutely. Uh, and they can be made new again. The potential challenge, if we move to the quantitative side, when you are trying to change a building from what its original intended use was, so I just highlighted over on the west wing these four walls in red. The primary structural system for the bulk of this building is masonry bearing walls, which are supporting the floors and the roof above, right? So that means that the floor and the, the roof and the floor loads get transferred down through the masonry bearing walls to the foundation below. That's how the building stays standing. Um, that's all well and good, but those define sort of major subpartitions within the building. To change the existing building structure is something that's different than the HVAC, the finishes, um, the envelope, all those types of things. Because to change the building structure, you essentially have to demolish it. And when you do that, you're in essence tearing the building down. So if you are looking to renovate a building, that's kind of the one constraint that you really have to work within, right? So that's exactly what's done in this plan. You can see that this plan does not change any of the major structural divisions, but it does go inside to all the non-structural walls and clear them out, gut them out, repurpose, um, reorganize, reorient the spaces within to make it as efficient as can be. On the east wing, where you had a 12-foot wide corridor, that's even potentially wide enough that maybe you jut out and build some space in the corridor. A six or an eight foot wide corridor is not quite wide enough to do that. So you're kind of stuck with the six or the eight foot wide corridor. So at the end of the day, you can look at multiple renovation options for doing that. How aggressive do you want to get with those kind of interior teardowns? And you can end up, you can drop that building multiplier into the 1.8, even 1.6 range. You've got a 55 to 60% efficient building. Better than the 50% efficient building we had, but that's where we are. You have a new building, it's a blank slate, it's a clean table. You can build whatever you want. You can set up the structural system appropriate for an office building for current and future flexibility. You can design and orient the spaces such that they're appropriately sized for that use. Clearly, if you do that, it's gonna be more efficient, right? You're starting from the ground up. Your building multiplier can drop below 1.4. Now you have a building that's north of 75% efficient. What's the big takeaway? You get the same program in a smaller building, right? So you're using a smaller building to achieve the same objectives that you're trying to achieve in, in a larger building. The, um, the feasibility study evaluated multiple pros and cons for, for every option, for all the scenarios, but I took time to focus on the building multiplier and the efficiency um, because I believe that that was a key component when the board just over two years ago voted to move forward with the design and construction of a new central office building. I think that was a driving factor. Um, I believe that because at the same time there was a recommendation from the board, a strong recommendation, that yes, we want to move forward with the design and construction of a new office building, but we do not want to demolish this building. We want to retain this building for an alternate use. We don't know what that is yet. I think that was in recognition of the fact that this building is both worthy and capable of being renovated, but that its use as an office building or the central office for Queen Anne's County Public Schools is perhaps not its best and most efficient use. When that decision was made, very soon after that, a request for qualifications was issued uh, for the design of the new central office building. That was open to any design firm that wanted to submit. There was a selection committee that was formulated. They reviewed the proposals. Thankfully for us, we were selected to design the new building um, and awarded the contract in February of, of last year. So that's where we really launch into what you've seen now over uh, in presentations over the past year, and I'll try to quickly run through some of those, again, to bring people up to speed who may not have seen this before. So the initial step, once we're awarded the design of the new building, is again, programming. It all starts with program. 
what needs to be in the building. That means meeting with departments, and it means taking that program and then applying it to a concept. Spreadsheets again, we've got a program, meeting with departments, what are your quantitative space needs? In concept, we're really focused on the quantitative side of it. What are your quantitative space needs? We come to a total building program and gross building of 34,000 square feet. So we've got a 34,000 square foot building instead of a 47,000 square foot building, right? If you go back to the feasibility study. We need to take that program and now start to apply it to a site. So that's the column on the right-hand side of the page. We started to subdivide this departmental input into essentially 4,000 square foot or multiple of 4,000 square foot building blocks. This is a little Caterpillar video you may remember from a year or so ago. These are the building blocks. We have a specific site. It's the Vincent C. Street site. It has its own site and environmental challenges. It has uh, zoning requirements. So we take those building blocks. We start to arrange them on the site. We respond to solar orientation and the environment. We start to push and pull those volumes. And that is kind of as far as the concept phase gets, right? We validate the program. Um, we get the concept. Once we start moving into planning the inside of the building and how things go together, now we're entering the formal design phases. So the formal design phases, there are three major design phases, schematic design, design development, and construction documents. Schematic design was initiated uh, in November of last year. That's when we start to meet with the planning commission. So in the schematic design, we are starting not only the building design process, but the site development review process, which is going to include um, a required planning commission approval because the regulatory authority for this building would be the town of Centerville. Um, the end of the schematic design phase, I'm going to touch on what we did in the schematic design phase in a, in a minute, but kind of the marker for the end of the schematic design phase was a required meeting with the Board of Appeals. Um, there was essentially an administrative item that needed to be reconciled in terms of a split zoning line. You might remember me talking about that at previous meetings. That required Board of Appeals approval, uh, which was not an issue, but that, that kind of marked the end of that phase. So in schematic design, we take that qualitative input from the departments and, um, that, sorry, the quantitative input, and then we start to put qualitative um, uh, feedback in there as well. So it's meeting with the departments again. It's understanding, okay, you needed X square footage. Now, how is that space subdivided? What offices want to be adjacent to each other? What kind of access do you need to public shared spaces, conference rooms, et cetera, et cetera? You start to lay out the building. We look at these shared uh, public spaces. We gained a lot of efficiency by not necessarily assigning conference rooms to specific departments, but having shared conference rooms around uh, the building, shared restrooms shown in the blue. Also looking at how that interior program is gonna start to affect the exterior architecture. So the areas in purple, when we talked about pulling those um, those volumes, those building blocks up to the north. Uh, we start looking at larger open areas within the plan, which would be flexible in the short term to accommodate shifts in departments and things like that, but also wanting to provide all staff in the building with access to natural daylight. We're also doing the site development at the same time. Um, the preliminary feedback, the biggest things that happen during schematic, you can see that split zoning line. If you see the dashed line running right across the site, that's what required Board of Appeals approval. Also, two building um, outlines, one in red, one in black. We initially started pushing the building as far north and east as we could to hold the road. That's per Town of Centerville design guidelines. Um, the Planning Commission came back and said that the town um, has intentions of some point in the future of widening Route 304 into more of a boulevard-like setting uh, for an entry into town so that there was a, a, an easement and a right-of-way that the building needed to respect. So that building moved south and west uh, at that point in the process. Also looked at preliminary landscape design, layout, meeting all those requirements ended with Board of Appeals approval that marked the end of the schematic design phase. Second major design phase, design development, March to May of this year. 
um, continuing to do site development and also work on the building interior. The Planning Commission asked us to come back during design development. We met with you again around the same time. They were very interested in the architectural context uh, that this building was going to be in because formally, as they saw the building blocks on the site, it didn't look like anything they'd seen before and they wanted to understand how that related to the architectural context. So we talked about three uh, architectural contexts that the building finds itself in. One is the specific institutional architectural context of Centerville, right? So the institutional buildings in Centerville, in large part, there seems to be a ubiquitousness of this red brick. Um, you know, even though the buildings might be different formally, there was a common materiality that carried across them. The second context was the immediate site context of the uh, Vincent Street site. So you have Queen Anne's County High School on one side, you have the county office building and the almost finished YMCA on the other side. Um, those buildings are clearly more contemporary architecturally uh, in character um, than some of those other buildings. Uh, and, and with this building form sort of, sort of an institutional enclave on the east side of town. The context that we thought spoke the most to this building was the larger agrarian context of Centerville and the surrounding uh, and the surrounding area. So as you drive around and you see these different farms and the buildings on the farms, the buildings across the landscape don't read so much as buildings. They read as volumes. They read as volumes in the landscape and they're an aggregate collection of these volumes. So you have these metal roofs, but you have these very simple volumetric shapes. You don't have a lot of necessarily uh, specific one building architectural significance. Um, we took some of that materiality. The Planning Commission wanted to hear about that material. We recognized the importance of the red brick in the institutional context of Centerville. We wanted to play around with taking some of those metal roofs and pulling them down on the facade. We wanted to show them how that could happen and then introduce a contemporary material that helps us achieve some of those interior goals of introducing natural daylight for all the building inhabitants. So this is fiberglass insulated panel. As the building opens up to the north, it lets that really diffuse daylight in uh, deep into the space while not allowing glare and, and those types of things to penetrate in. Also very, very good from an insulating standpoint, much more insulated than say a, a traditional window. Focusing on the exterior architecture, focusing more on the qualitative development of the interior plan, understanding, again, just re-verifying with departments, this is where things need to be, some push and pull uh, between square footages because we're not going over 34,000 square feet, so you gotta make it work, you know, uh, within, within that envelope. And to bring it back around to the efficiency, right, you end up with, with a very efficient building. You end up with a building, an 80% efficient building, a multiplier of 1.25 uh, at that spot. Again, looking at development, the areas you saw in purple in, uh, in the schematic design have developed these blue areas. Looking at how we do that with the structure, how does the mechanical uh, interface with that and the culmination of the design development phase is a presentation to the Planning Commission, a third presentation to the Planning Commission, coming back and showing them after the discussion about architectural context, here's where we ended up. Predominant building material is red brick, uh, very simple material palette. There are three materials, it's red brick, it's metal panel, and it's translucent fiberglass insulated uh, panel. Uh, and here are some views from the ground and the overall elevations. Um, and the culmination of that design development phase then was with planning commission approval uh, in May. So then we enter the final phase, construction documents. That's where we are now. We're coming up to the end of, of our project design phase. Um, we are looking at completing the documents before Halloween. What do you do in construction documents? You quite literally do that. You are now taking the documents, you, You've taken the design that's been developed. You are producing a set of documents that can be competitively bid and can be constructed, right? So that somebody, 
uh, can come and actually build this building. So from a site development standpoint, it's working on the utilities, it's fleshing out the landscape plan, it's working on the parking, all the things outside the building, on the interior of the building. It's looking at the furniture layouts. It's making sure that there's proper electrical and data connections for all of those um, types of situations. It is moving through building sections and making sure systems are coordinated, the structure and the mechanical are playing nicely together. They can all fit in the spaces as designed. It's looking at wall sections, making sure that you have a weather type building, you have an envelope, you have um, uh, wall constructions that go from the foundation up to the roof. It's looking at specific flashing details, structural interfaces. It's, it's making that set of documents that somebody can now go ahead and build this building. Um, it is integrating the systems in the building, the mechanical systems, um, and the image on the upper right, that's a geothermal well field under the, um, under the parking lot. So you've got a geothermal uh, system in the building, a very, very efficient uh, mechanical system, which will function for all the, all the spaces. Um, and at the end of the day, when we're finished, you know, the little caterpillar diagram has, has moved on to this. This is representative, we hope, of what the finished building um, will, will look like when it's finished. So this is uh, sort of bird's eye from the, from the south, looking across the parking lot at ground level to the building entrance. On the north side, you can see those volumes as they um, have been pulled up to allow that uh, daylight in through the translucent panels. You've got the courtyard that opens to the sort of public center of the building um, on the northern side. And then, you know, starting to show people hopefully what the inside of the building will, will look like as well. So as we move um, through the front door, you have a security vestibule similar to what you'll see in, in many of your schools that, that continue to be implemented. Uh, the public meeting room sort of the corollary to this room that we're in right now, will be immediately adjacent um, off the left as you come into the building. That's subdividable with, uh, with an operable partition into two smaller spaces. Uh, when you exit the north side of the meeting room, you come into a space that looks out into the courtyard. It's kind of the central circulation knuckle for the whole building. We call that the gallery. This could be a great pre-function space for public meetings or events that happen in this room, but on a daily basis, also a good place for staff to have informal meetings, lunch, anything like that. Um, and then a shot just as we walk back into one of the uh, departmental areas, what you would see as you move back through the corridor and then into that kind of open volume that opens up with the translucent insulated glazing, the systems changeable furniture uh, in that space where majority of staff will be housed, you know, around, around the building in this. We made the building permit submission right at the beginning of this month um, and hope to get you know, the feedback, hope to get approval on the, on the building permit. Um, and again, the intention is to be done uh, with construction documents by Halloween to advertise for construction and bidding in November and December of this year. Uh, with that done, the intention would then be um, award and notice to proceed to the construction contractor in January of 24. Most recent construction estimate has the building at 18.3 million construction cost. Construction would be anticipated to take right around 16 months, which if that timeline is hit, would put the building finishing in May of 25, which would allow summer of 25, um, for systems and IT setup. There's a lot of things that internal staff will need to do at the new building before then it's ready for everybody to head over there for final full occupancy in, in fall of 25. That's the projected timeline. Um, this is, a, this is a, a close to home project for us. It's a project we have very much enjoyed working with the stakeholders on. Um, and we're really excited about the building that came out of this process. We, the end goal <laughs> is that you are also excited about the building and that uh, the citizens of Queen Anne's County are excited about the building. Um, 
but that's that's where we are today, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you have. Great, really impressive. Questions? When, when you said geothermal, is that a closed system? Where it's, it's not going to, yeah, the, the it, water can stay in its system. It's correct. not going to be injected back or anything. No, yeah, and it's actually it's not water. It's glycol, but it's a closed, it's, it's a closed, closed, system closed loop the, system. The ground's yep. going to cool it and heat it, not. Yep. Well, so the ground, well. yep. So it's glycol uh, loops that go down into the ground, and then the ground is 55 degrees, right? So that heats or cools what you want, but the glycol is just basically the the okay. heat transfer mechanism. This is not an open drilling into an aquifer and sucking water up. No. Because well, I know around here we've had problem with iron and stuff and that sure. can really yep. jam up stuff. No. The other yep. thing is, Mr. Pinder, is this compatible to our, I mean, I know we've had some issues like with Johnson controls and some different things. Whatever we're going to bid on these documents, I know you want the best thing, but we also have to be compatible so we don't have one system here and another system not talking to somebody. We understand, I mean, when it goes out, it could be compatible to what we do. Yes, you could put all alternates in there for that. Okay. You know, standardizing the system so it is compatible with, you know, our other schools and not having something that's kind of a Stand outlier, you know, standalone. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so we we'll have that in there when we do our bid documents yes. because you know, they can't, you know, it just, in the long run, it could cost us a lot of money if we don't. That's correct. Yes, we can do that. For the uh, maintenance of the stormwater management BMPs, is that something that the county will be able to handle, or are they, is that going to need to be contracted out? I, I don't know the answer to that, how operationally, how that would be dealt with. I don't know if, you know, if traditionally if the school system contracts out the stormwater management are you talking about the, uh, after it is constructed yeah. and upkeep yeah um that would be in partnership with uh parks and rec okay. um and working with uh, dpw all right thank you sure any other questions comments no no guys thanks a lot thank very you. informative thank you which brings us to the next issue on the information items, and that's discussion of the current central office or the future. So I ask that you just stay here in case there's a question <laughs> that I can't answer. For sure. Okay. <laughs> but the board may have, and I may not be able to answer that. So we've had lots of discussions about this. So um, the team has, so I feel confident that they have uh, answers. Well, one of my things thinking, there's been committees to study this building, and when we went this to either renovation or new, but it's historical, so it's going to be kept. Part, portions of the historical part of this building are to be kept. I mean, and that's what the uh, community wants. I think that's what the commissioners have signed on for. As a board member, I think there's an opportunity here to have our CTE program here. That, you know, we have it at our high school. Mm -hmm. It's dual for both our high schools, like our welding departments and some things like that. And I would just like to talk to this board about what advantage that be in possibly saying a letter to the commissioners that one of our ideas, and it's been studied before, but just said the board would support, even though once this new building is built, it reverts to the county, but it could stay as educational building as part of our maybe a CTE program. And I don't know how the rest of the board feels about that. Because once we move it, the CTE, if we were to move the CTE program here, mm -hmm. we would free up classrooms at both high schools thereby possibly eliminating portables, which seems to be a thorn in some people's side, to have our kids out in so, portables. So. so we would be looking at um, eight programs. All Seven of those programs would come from Queen Anne's County High School. Right. One of those would come from Chesapeake College, because currently our culinary students, Yes. because we don't have any Alignment. opportunity for right. them, so we've partnered to be able to provide that opportunity. So we would help be able to house eight of those um, you know, uh, programs here in this building. Um, that would free up space in Queen Anne's County High School because I don't want people to get the impression that our CTE programs are in the portables. No, no, so no. So we have our CTE programs are in high Queen Anne's County High School. Correct. So we would have, some of those would need to be redesigned, but we would relocate those classrooms into the high school, the high school um, envelope. And um, as I said, some of those spaces may need to be renovated to be acceptable for classroom use because we have things like cosmetology um, that would have to you know that space would have to be renovated right. um, you have the welding mm -hmm. you know for the construction program and right. those things um, they may notice. they may need some renovations as well to make them suitable for the classroom instruction but absolutely 100 percent that would positively impact um, portables in the sense that we wouldn't need those there are there 
how many programs will we be able to move out of Kent Island High School? Any? We really wouldn't look to do any. So those students currently come to Queen Anne's County High School to access the programming. So welding, construction, cosmetology, health oc, um, as I said, culinary would be one, and um, Mechan um, mechanical, automotive, right, automotive yeah. and there's one more. But all of those students from Ken Island currently come to Queen Anne's to, Queen Anne's to access those programs. So that we wouldn't, the, the other programs um, that we wouldn't house here that we would still offer, such as um, bioengineering and things like that, are already at both, Teacher Academy are already at both schools. So we wouldn't need to relocate those. Um, those programs are being successfully offered at both high schools. Gotcha. Yeah. But but, but Queen Anne's does. I mean, I've heard this before. I'm, I think with one of our previous principals, you know, there's an influx. Not it's good, but there's students coming from Ken Island up to Queen Anne's, which adds added pressure to the uh, capacity there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And to me, this standalone CT, which I think is a wave of our future. I think this board's been very committed yeah. to the CT program. We mm -hmm. uh, we are currently not over enrolled in Queen Anne's County High School. Right. Um, at Ken Island High School, we are about 2% over enrollment there, um, which we were the day we opened the building. But Queen Anne's County High School, any one given day during the day is overcrowded because they have Ken Island High School students that are accessing programs there, if that makes sense. Um, I just think it would be, to me it would be, it looks like a win-win for everybody, but I would just right. think if we, you know, we're moving with this project, this building is going to be here, part of yeah. it. Uh, and it would just, I think the board, it's plus, it gives a boost to our CTE program. I mean, CTE programming is nothing but growing. Yeah. We know that. That's part of the blueprint. We actually now have a, a completely designated mm -hmm. supervisor just for CTE that is grant funded. Um, and, and so we know that, that the programming is only going to be expanding. Um, and, and there's going to be great opportunities for kids there. And we love that aspect. Um, but right now, we, we actually added a bus run um, because we have so many kids coming over to access programming. And you know, it's uniquely so, we were just discussing the, you know, the enrollment and the envelope there at Ken Island High School because we are 2% over. And, but at any given time during the day, we are not because we have kids that are accessing dual enrollment mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. We have students that are doing internships, we have students that are doing apprenticeships, and we have students who are going, um, to Ken Island, I mean to Queen Anne's County High School to access programming. So really, even though they're quote unquote on paper, 2% over, they're really not over in their enrollment because their mm -hmm. student body isn't all there at the same time every day, all day long. And right. the closeness to Queen Anne's County High School to me, I mean, you move children, you have a transportation issue no matter what you do, but it was, it's not a stand, you know, it's still in the vicinity very closely oriented to where we are. Yes. And I just think, yes. you know, it'd be to me a good use. It's just, plenty of space here. Yes, and, and really we've talked um, extensively, and Jeremy, please feel free to jump in, but what we've looked at in um, the one slide where it showed um, this central office, and Jeremy brought the attention that the corridors back here are so much smaller, well, all that would be removed, and really the, the front part, um, that the original part is what we would really look at um, utilizing that space and then building out behind it yeah. with the things that you would need as it relates to automotive, you know, having um, the garage, welding, a, a welding um, an area. So being able to build those spaces out, even a culinary type opportunity for kids as well. So there's 13 acres of property right here that the board sits on. So you have room for expansion for that. And I'm saying like construction. I mean, I think somebody said when we, I don't know if we build sheds or not, but when you're building a modular shed or something, you'd have more room out here to do that and you would on, well, yeah. the, on, the, on the school property. You know, yeah, I mean, you could have the big doors that, that roll open so that way students could access in and out for cars, bringing cars in to repair cars and things like that. And um, they, they definitely would give us an opportunity to design programming that would meet the needs of kids. Where, where we are right now, we don't have, we can't expand out. We, right. we can't really do, you know, for welding, I don't remember how many stations we have, but I don't know, but it's not enough. I think we have eight and, and we've been squeezing kids up together and you can only do that for so long. Um, but, you know, we could definitely design something that would, I think, be a better fit for students and as, it, as our CTE programs grow. And I think it's critical. This, this building is a historical part of this district. Mm -hmm. And I know we do have a group of 
our community members who the board has heard from before that have a passion to um, reignite this building and continue the issues as part of the education here in Queen Anne's County. And, and I think it's a win-win situation. I think that part of the community wins in that aspect of the historical nature of it, but then I think our kids win big time because they're gonna have a facility that better meets their needs. Also, there was, in the fall of uh, 2022, Mr. Uh, Lee Edgar from the Queen Anne's County government spearheaded the uh, committee, um, uh, administration building committee, and basically it was made up of uh, Queen Anne's County government, um, town of Centerville alumni, um, former employees um, of you know, the Board of Education. And I believe it was about five or six meetings that we met and the report was given to the um, county commissioners uh, in February um, of 2022. And basically they had it broken down into three sections. The preferred route would be a continued education, uh, educational or institutional usage. Um, public school, CTE was part of that. Um, the other part was um, housing or workforce or elder career, um, elder center here, um, or office uh, administration. The overall recommendation presented uh, was for an educational institutional use for that time. Um, but the committee was very set on keeping it as, as educational. <laughs> Yeah, if, <clears throat> obviously we didn't uh, we didn't look at designing anything in this building as part of when we were designing the new building, but um, it's been a topic that has come up many times in our meetings just because there is a lot of passion about this building. Um, just you know, based on the feasibility study, looking at this, which was really looking at the suitability of this building for use as an office building, which is not ideal. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but it's not ideal. Um, it seems like as you move to the construction of the new building, you open up an opportunity here. If you go back to what I was saying about the qualitative and the quantitative, right? You, no matter what you use this building for, if you decide to use it for something, you have to address qualitative issues. That's, it's just the way it is. The building needs work, right? It's, it, it just needs work. Um, but at that point, as you have relocated to another place, you now have building stock, which is important to a lot of people in town because of the historical nature, because people went here as school, and it was designed as a school. So the overall space divisions would be much more successfully utilized for some type of use like that, whether it's CTE or something else. It gives you options for different different things that you might explore. Since the building is a historical building, is there a committee that would have to be in place to say like what you guys can or can't do so, to it or how? So the building, to the best of my knowledge, is not on any historical register okay. uh, at this point. That doesn't mean it couldn't be, or application couldn't be made for that, to pursue for that. You know, it certainly, from an age standpoint, would meet those requirements, but it is not on a state or national historic I register. I don't think it's registered or listed. Yeah. Uh, it's on a register, and the town has no historical, I mean, they like certain things, but there's no, it's not in a historical district or anything. Correct. So there's no, right now, there's no formal regulatory requirements related to that. Okay. But Thank if there you. was, that just means we couldn't tear it down. I think, public, I think public opinion is not going it. to, I could be <laughs> yeah. wrong, but I don't think public opinion or the commissioners are going to allow this building to be, the historical part of this building to be torn down. No, 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 so, I get that, but I'm saying if it had histor a historical oh, yeah, branding, the, does that mean we, not only does it mean we can't tear it down, but does that mean we also can't make, we can't modify it or do so anything to it? If if there is a historic easement on a building, like the Maryland Historical Trust or a body like that, um, that historic easement means that they then have approval authority over What's modification. Started? Yes, gotcha. modifications that you're making to the building. Um, typically, that will primarily concern the exterior of the building, not so much the interior of the building. But if that easement were in place, they'd 
they would want to see all the plans for the building. Gotcha. Again, that's not the case right now. Sure. Usually you would see it like the main building, like you said, was built in 1901. It would like encompass that and then all the other sections, depending on like how old they were, that would just usually fall under that main section to make sure that wasn't, you know, torn down or they didn't redo the outside so it didn't match what the original was. But if you don't have anything like Periods that, of historical significance. An example in Centerville is their armory. That's, it's listed but not registered. Right. right. And that's what happened when Y, uh, y did some renovation. Uh, but at the moment, it's the county <clears throat> that owns the building. And well, we, well, ultimately, we they're going to be, right. the commissioners are going to be deciding the ultimate disposition. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like we want to at least formally ask them if we have not already to use it for CTE, as we discussed tonight. So, I mean, that's what I would think this board would, you know, ask them and suggest that that would be one of our primary you know, uses for it if, we, if they want head, to. So. Is everybody I good for that? I support it 100%. Yeah, I'm in agreement. I'm, I'm in agreement. Yeah, I don't think we need a vote, but no. can you yeah. draft up a we formal? Ask, can for you for your can signature. We can absolutely do that. Can? Yeah. All right. I think it's the right thing to do. Agreed. Any other uh, comments on that discussion? All right. Well, thank I think uh, that's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, oh, Daryl gets to stay here. Okay, comprehensive. <laughs> yeah. One gets Daryl released. Daryl gets <laughs> dismissed, yep. I guess, Mr. Fine. Yep. <laughs> comprehensive maintenance plan presentation. Mr. Barilow? Barilow? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daryl Barraclo, School Facility Planner, and with me is... Uh, Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer. Okay. Uh, coming before you tonight with the Comprehensive Maintenance Plan for 2023. Um, the purpose of the Comprehensive Maintenance Plan is basically a tool for communication uh, between the uh, LEA and the, sh the stakeholders, which is the predominant partner, and that is the, the state of Maryland, the IAC. Um, they want to make sure that with their investment uh, in systemic renovation projects, new construction projects, and the other uh, investments that they make with the county, that we are maintaining our schools at the best, uh, the, the best that we can in order to uh, provide the best teaching environments for the students, as well as getting the best uh, longevity out of the equipment and various pieces that, that go into that. Uh, the, the Comprehensive Maintenance Plan, or CMP, plays an integral role in the development of our capital improvement program, and it also plays a role in the, uh, the operations budget as well. Uh, and I will be coming before you next month to present the, um, the, the capital improvement program. So the comprehensive maintenance plan is required by COMAR to be uh, updated annually and submitted to the Interagency Commission on School Construction. And there are some legalese here, but I'm, I'm obviously not going to quote all of that. But just uh, in a nutshell, it is required by COMAR that we produce that annually. And it is a requirement that it gets presented by the board and that the board approves it. And that's the document that goes to the state. Relationship between the CIP and the operating budget. Um, there's a there's a number of things that go into um, the comprehensive maintenance plan that we review and go through um, to help develop things like the uh, capital improvement plan as well as the operating budget. Uh, some of them include the number of work orders that are generated. Uh, we review the number of work orders because that can kind of begin to tell a roadmap of where uh, constant problems come back uh, throughout the year, whether it's constant roof leaks, that can be indicative of a roof that needs to be replaced, um, HVAC callbacks, things that, um, whether it's controls or whether it is um, faulty equipment with motors failing or whatever the case might be, we look at those um, that could, again, drive a systemic HVAC renovation. Other things that the, uh, the, the comprehensive maintenance plan is going to do is, um, again, with the state, they do require annual roof inspections as well as bleacher inspections. And those, again, go back to whether or not we need systemic renovations to address those things. Um, one of the things that um, 
I'm not sure if this was presented in prior years, but one of the things that you might see in this year's CMP that was not done in previous CMPs, what we've started to do is um, we, we project out um, an eight-year cycle for in interior painting of our schools. So what we've done with this year's CMP is uh, we've created some um, projections on things like uh, interior school painting, uh, paving projects. Uh, one of the other ones that you'll see in one of the other slides that I come up with is the, um, are, are the playgrounds that we need to renovate and improve. Um, and this, is, th this slide here is actually um, three different slides from the, um, from the comprehensive maintenance plan. And again, what this is showing is, again, the completed interior painting, projected interior painting, painting interior painting, um, asphalt milling and paving, and the playgrounds and play surface. And what, again, what this does is, is this will help um, provide the state and other stakeholders, whether it's the county or whomever, um, kind of a roadmap for what you will see in next month's presentation, where the next month's presentation will show uh, in, in projected fiscal years, things like uh, playground replacements and uh, asphalt milling and those other sorts of, of uh, regularly scheduled maintenance that we need to plug into the CIP so it is properly funded. So in a nutshell, um, or collectively, you, you, the, the document is about 800 pages. There's a lot of information there. Um, the gist of the program is, is in the, the, the numbered pages of 1 through 15. So there's about 15 pages of good information there. Uh, one of the important uh, things to point out is the fact that we have about 1.3 million square feet of uh, school area, and we have well, we have open space, well, we have two open spaces in maintenance. We have nine fill positions. We have 11, 11 positions. Um, that's a lot of square footage for 11 guys to, to manage and maintain. Um, I think they do a, a great job. I think to note that with that many, uh, that much square footage, the median size house is about 2,014 square feet. So we're taking care of 680 houses. So each technician really has responsible for 68 houses. I mean, to put that kind of into perspective of what we're doing. And then some other points to note in the front page, it, we're trying to have a longevity of the building of 40 years. I mean, we were talking about this building 120 years, but you know, for 40 years, but um, to close out about 3,500 tickets a year by the maintenance department with only nine to 11 people, you know, um, is, quite impressive but again you know if you look at the state requirements I mean I know we can't jump the state requires us to have about 20 full-time but I I would like to give credit to Dr. Uh, Salins for moving us up because when Ken Island High School was built that was the last time a maintenance person was added so we're going back 25 years so we've been able to jump up to 11 and hopefully we can continue to grow with the needs you know placed up, placed upon us I think that is it. So, questions? Well, I was chiming in what Mr. Pender said, the, the, the comparison to how many houses we're maintaining. Mm. But a house isn't used like these buildings are. That's true. I mean, the high school is used 18 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Most of these schools use 12. It looks like a mall. These doors never stop. Yeah. Kids are Very going close. in and out. It's There's a lot point. of movement. It's, I mean, your house sits, you know, at nighttime, it doesn't do anything. And during the daytime, you're not there. It amazes me of what we get done. And I give kudos to our staff and, you know, and it's well-maintained. I mean, you go in there, our buildings, I feel they're well-maintained, you know, even though, you know, one day my granddaughter at the air conditioner wasn't working well, you know, doesn't work in the house some days even, you know what I mean? And I can't tell you what's happening. You didn't but, have air conditioning. Yeah. Well, I know. Well, that's another thing. I, <laughs> that I tell you, is so listen, true. Listen, you're younger than me. We need well, to, the, the other <laughs> portion of this is true. the state is now basically forcing us. We have a work order system, computerized. But now the state wants us to upgrade that so that you can calculate how many hours you're spending on each job and what the cost is associated with it. I mean, it's a lot more, but, you know, sometimes the gentleman from maintenance come in and have lunch. Now, I was telling somebody earlier that, you know, they have their laptops sitting out, closing out tickets while they're eating their lunch. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good bunch. It's a good group, but they are spread thin, but they, they do a tremendous job of what we have with what we have. 
and I think we've done a lot of projects this summer. I mean, it's amazed me mm -hmm. what's gotten done between painting and roof yes. and stuff like that. It's just long. <laughs> it's hot. It's hot. Mm -hmm. Parking lot looks good at Queen yeah. County High. Right. So you know. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any other comments? So, so we back need a motion. Yeah, I'm coming back. Mr. President, for... I move that we approve the 2023. Oh, it's we... not. This is no. just oh. informational. It's item. just information. Oh, is it? Okay. Oh, it says action. Actions later. Action later. later. Action later. Oh, action okay. later. Sorry about that. Yeah. It's... I'll be back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Actions next uh, month. Girl. All right. Yeah. That just means it's probably going to go much faster when we get to yes. the action item, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it won't be anything. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Sprankle, yes. spotlight presentation. All right, good evening. Okay. Okay, present. Well, here we are. Good evening, President Schiffinelli, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team members. It gives me, I am Marcia Sprankle, <laughs> assistant superintendent. It gives me a pleasure to actually present our September spotlight, which captures like all of our like happenings, like for the first week of school. So I'm really excited to present this this evening. So bear with me, we've got some great things happening in our schools. First up, we have Bayside Elementary School students and staff were excited for the first day of school. Everyone met in the gym so that they could find their teachers. The teachers actually assigned students signs to walk around with so that they could make sure that they had all of their students for their homeroom class. Bayside held a, held a back to school night, pep, uh, back to school pep rally, I should say, to talk about school expectations as well and to get the students all excited about starting a new school year. They learn the Bayside cheer and celebrated their new school year. What a wonderful time. At Centerville Elementary School, the eight students were welcomed into the doors the first week of school. They had some special guests there. They actually had Dr. Salins there greeting them along with Ms. Farnell, Sheriff Hoffman, and of course, their mascot, Cubby. Cubby actually gave students high fives and welcomed students. Congratulations, I'd like to say, to Cameron Lloyd, who's a second grader at Centerville Elementary School. He won the Crumpton Volunteer Fire Department raffle and rode on the fire truck the first day of school. Can you imagine that? Oh my goodness, that's a day he'll never forget for sure. Centerville Elementary School, Welcome their wonderful teachers, including some of their new teachers. And there they are. Next up, we have Churchill Elementary School. The Juni Center hosted a before school event for pre-kindergarten and new kindergarten students. Students and families boarded buses to learn those expectations and to take a little tour around town. Um, this helped, their st helped the students and their families adjust to being separated from one another. So it was a great idea. Kudos to Churchill Elementary School students. Next, Graysonville Elementary School held for their pre-K students and some of their new kindergarten families what was called a Boohoo Yahoo. If you can imagine, it is hard the first day of school for families to separate and for students to separate. So sometimes we see tears and sometimes we see excitement from those families so that they can have some extra time to prepare things at home and get ready for the evening activities. Um, families were actually greeted by Principal Tubman as well as PTA. So families had an opportunity to stick around, to refuel, to gather and collect themselves as they saw their little pre-K students and kindergarten students move down the halls of Graysonville Elementary School. Kennard Elementary School. Ms. Carrie and Steph, staff had, 
held a back to school expectation assembly for students. Here you can see pictured a very excited third grader, mm -hmm. excited for her first day at Kennard Elementary School. I would have to say Kennard Elementary School staff and faculty worked extremely hard to welcome their students back to school the first day. Uh, they really, really worked. They even worked across the week, uh, through the weekend to make sure that they were ready. So kudos to that staff. Pictured here, you can see the fifth grade students hard at work. There's a class there. Next up is Ken Island Elementary School. Students in the blended pre-K program use shaving cream to write the first letter of their first name, along with just having some fun with shaving cream. I'll bet that classroom smelled really, really good. <laughs> Students in pre-K also made full use of their quiet and nap time. As you can see, they were pretty exhausted. <laughs> Second grade students listened to a story that was titled, Don't Eat Your Classmate, <laughs> which was great. and was about being kind and rules. Again, talking about school expectations. There was a new student making friends. You can see him pictured on the right. Everybody, all of his new classmates were checking out his new chair. And what a cool chair that is. Had a chance to see it myself. <laughs> Mattapeak Elementary School sailed into a new year. And there we go with Principal Carrie Mitten and Assistant Principal Sarah White welcomed their staff for the 2023-24 school year uh, with building. Um, they had t-shirts and also Mrs. Milton, uh, Ms. Mitten as well as Ms. White. They made special gifts for their entire staff, wreaths so that they could actually have those on the doors. And so it was great, 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 great time. They enjoyed a potluck breakfast and then they did some collaboration and then they went to went on to work back to work again they hosted a meet and greet friday before school started with information tables and classroom tours settlersville elementary school staff had a great start to the year with activities to build on their strengths at the meet and greet students met the teacher parents signed the hopes and dream wall and families participated in the scavenger hunt. At Centerville Middle School, Centerville Middle School's faculty and staff were very happy to jump back into the swing of things and most of the students were as equally excited. Sixth grade spent some time doing team building activities, one in particular with hula hoops Actually, Dr. Sales and I had a chance to observe that. <laughs> Kids were having lots and lots of fun, and they were a little competitive as well. <laughs> Barkley, the mascot, gave high fives and welcomed students back. Seventh grade jumped right back into routine with hard work that first week of school. The new SRO, McAdams, started to become familiar with students. We appreciate all of our SROs for sure. Mattapeak Middle School, pictured in the photo on the left, is the lovely Mattapeak Middle School staff, along with Ms. Chambers. Dr. Salins greeted the staff at Mattapeak Middle School, along with Dr. Kibler and yours truly also was on that visit. I had a special assignment from Miss <laughs> Dennis. Stevensville Middle School. Teachers launched their week of professional development with Captain Kidd's treasure hunt. Groups rotated among eight historic sites. That's what happened there. Kent Island Heritage Society and analyzed objects Captain Kidd might have used to use have used with his pair with his pirates in the past. The first day was focused on team building relationships, students paired to untangle themselves. Students were challenged to create card towers 
with the highest, sturdiest structures as a group. Groups also use vertical workspaces to brainstorm creative ways to problem solve. They're off to an excellent start at Stevensville Middle School. The SRO, DFC Cooper, and Sheriff Hoffman visited Sutlersville Middle School. Sixth grade students in Ms. Baldwin's class were blasting off by boosting skills, playing brain games, and channeling their inner math superheroes. Meanwhile, in eighth grade, some of the head honchos of Sutlersville Middle School were caught grabbing some water to stay hydrated. <laughs> The Thunderbirds are sewing for sure. Kent Island High School, the freshman class was engaged in goal setting and they were setting their goals as you can see pictured there. And of course, Mrs. Andrea Schulte, our QACPS Teacher of the Year has created a magnificent art space for our art students to enjoy each and every day. What a wonderful space for students to walk into every day. Queen Anne's County High School. Thank you to the community staff, parents, and students for making back to school night a success for sure. Representatives from central office were also on hand to answer questions about Schoology and power school. Of course, you can't help but notice that beautiful parking lot as you drive by with extra parking spaces. We're so excited for our students and our staff at Queen Anne's High School, for sure. And of course, if you visited Queen Anne's High School recently, you've noticed that single point entryway. You can't help but notice it, and we're thankful for making our schools one step closer to being safer each and every day. So we're excited about that. Also at Queen Anne's High County High School, you will notice that there's the new Career Center in the guidance office. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out, you have to check it out for sure. And of course, the lovely track. Uh -huh. That's at Queen Anne's County High School. It is beautiful. Lots of school spirit when students are on that track, for sure. Next up, our back to school highlights for Arise Academy focuses on the new location. There, they have motivational pieces or words throughout that section of the building, the second floor. Also, you can see picture there, a high school classroom as well as a middle school classroom. They're off to a great start over at the Arise Academy. Lots of summer fun with families at the Family Center of Queen Anne's County. The Family Center hosted a carnival theme playgroup in July. And Supervisor Angela Gieber of Early Childhood, of course, did face painting for children. She, we had a chance to test out her art skills there. And then we had Doug Lent, Communication Director from Maryland Family Network, visit as well and came to take photos for the event. It was wonderful. The Family Center also hosted water play groups with some fun snacks for the children to enjoy. We are pleased that Mrs. Andrea Schulte was named as one of Maryland's seven finalists for Teacher of the Year. Andrea Schulte addressed staff at the staff kickoff and the new teachers doing the new teachers orientation. She is extraordinary and we wish her the best of luck as we wait to find out who is named Maryland's Teacher of the Year. The announcement will be made next month at the Teacher of the Year Gala at Martin's West on October 13th. So we have our fingers crossed and we are just anxiously awaiting the announcement for sure. All right, Dr. Sprankle, it's always a pleasure. <laughs> and uh, this time is no exception. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Comments, you. anybody? All right, thanks. All right, we move into action items now, starting with comprehensive maintenance plan approval. Welcome back. 
He's back. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Darrell Barraclo, uh, School Facility Planner, Queen Anne's County Public Schools, seeking approval tonight for the Comprehensive Maintenance Plan. All right, I've got an order waiting to be signed, and uh, it's recommended by the superintendent. Do we have a motion? Mr. President, I move to approve the 2023 Comprehensive Maintenance Plan so it may be presented to the state. Second. All right, motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And that's it. Thank Perfect. you. Mm -hmm. awesome. Okay. Also on the action item tonight is uh, American Sign Language course approval. And we've gotten the yellow sheet earlier. Mr. Or Dr. Dr. Guy Dev. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, members of the board and the executive team. My name is Darren Guido, Supervisor of Instruction for Social Studies, World Languages, English Learners, and Service Learning for Queen Anne's County. Tonight, I come before the board seeking approval for a new high school world language course, American Sign Languages, levels one through four. The opportunity to offer this course was presented in August when we had a resignation of the Queen Anne's County French teacher. Uh, American Sign Language meets Comar graduation requirements for world language, and Queen Anne's would be one of the only counties on the eastern shore to offer this. It is offered in some other uh, counties, um, and students learning ASL will also be able to earn the seal of biliteracy, uh, just like our uh, oh, Spanish and French students have the opportunity to do as well. Excellent. Mm. I think it's great. I mean, when we first heard about it, I just thought it was a really nice out of the box thinking and, and needed. I mean, it certainly is a valuable language to have. Yes. So. Questions, no. No. other comments? Do we have a motion? Mr. President, I move to approve the board um, for the new world language course offering in our 23-24 high school program of study titled American Sign Language, level one through four. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thanks a lot, we appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay, um, future meetings, right after this board meeting at 6.30 tonight, we have the safety meeting. Um, it's gonna be on Quack TV. <laughs> Queen Anne's <laughs> County TV. And uh, the next uh, meeting is October 4th, 2023. That's our uh, normal open session at 6 p.m. And then October 18th, we will have at 5 p.m. The, our work session, normally scheduled work session. So anybody else got anything for the cause, as Mr. Smith would say? <laughs> Hearing nothing, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, good night. Thank you, everybody.